Do you feel like you're in an artistic rut? Well, today's video should help you a lot then because in today's video, I'm going to share with you five of my favorite new techniques that I've been playing with. I've been reading a lot, experimenting a lot, but I've been learning a lot of new techniques that have helped take my art to a new level. And I want to share them with you today. So let's go ahead and get started. And I'm going to share five new techniques that I've been playing with. Here's a new technique I've been playing with, and I use it in areas that I want to abstract a little. I want to take attention away from. I want it to be a quiet, but abstracted and watercolor dreamy look area. And the basic idea is that I paint an area, let it dry for a few minutes so the edges set a little bit, then in some form or the other, flood water over the parts you want to abstract. Because you let the edges half dry, some of the edge holds its shape and some melts to create a dreamy, blurred out look. This seems to work better with heavier paints that have larger particles like the earth pigments, lamp black and other granulating paints. So here I was experimenting with the technique with opera and lamp black. I was doing these experiments before I tried the idea on my real painting. I painted the area, then let it half dry, then sprayed it. Let's look at this idea at work in a real painting. I don't recommend you do this in a highly important area, like near the face or main area of interest. But in this painting, the cat's foot was hard to see in the reference. It was in a dark shadow and hard for me to see to paint it accurately. So I mostly just made it up. I painted the underpainting with cobalt, which is very granulating. Then I floated in lamp black which is also very granulating and has an extra interesting quality of having interesting action wet and wet where it makes capillaries that can look like fur or tiny rivulets. I did a really cool painting with my online students of a chick and I will link that here by the way. Some of this technique does depend on luck and practice, but it makes a lovely dreamy effect when it works the way you want it to and it always gives you a surprise, which I love about watercolor. Let's keep going with these fun dreamy techniques. And in this next technique, I'm going to show you how to make a melting, soft, dreamy edge. And dreamy edges are really important in a painting because if you have all hard edges, your painting is going to look stiff and it's just going to be kind of hard on the eyes. So make sure you have some soft, dreamy edges. Let's see how I incorporated a dreamy edge into my newest painting that I'm doing with my online students. She's having a cow. <laughs> Isn't that a great title? I love my students and some of the ideas they come up with. We have a lot of fun. You should join us. <laughs> but anyway, I painted Mama Cow's backside. And while it was good and wet, added some blue to show the reflection of the sky on her back. And then while everything was still quite wet, I painted the background right up to her back and let them melt and merge together. Then notice I work on other parts of the painting while this soft edge sets and dries a bit. And then I add a stroke of cream consistency burnt sienna just to add a little definition to her top line. But because the paper is still pretty wet, it stays really soft and blooms a little but the paper is dry enough that it holds its shape enough to hint at the top line. Also, the human mind will create its own edges because it is wired to do so when interpreting peripheral vision. Another example of a soft edge I allow to happen is at the bottom of this cat's stomach. And remember, if you wanna watch these paintings from start to finish, they are available in real time to my Patreon students. And you get access to a whole library of tutorials, not just one or two. But with this cat, as I was painting the ground other, under the cat, I noticed that there was too hard of a line under the stomach. So I took the opportunity to allow the bottom of the cat to melt into the ground color. In the reference, the values of the cat are similar to the values of the patio tiles. So this is also a clue to you as a painter where you can create a soft edge that makes sense to the viewer's eye. It's where your subject's values kind of match the background values and you can just let them melt together. Another new technique that I've really liked lately uses the power of a spray bottle and one of my favorite brushes that I always forget to use. And by the way, this brush is not expensive. So every artist should have these brushes. They're bamboo calligraphy brushes, and you can get lots of different versions of them, generic ones online. I bought mine on Amazon. These are natural hair bristles, so they splay really nicely. And when you splay them, the little tips that you get make really interesting brush marks, or you can point it into a tip and get very fine little details. And you can just get really beautiful calligraphic lines using this brush. And so I paired this brush with a spray bottle. Let me show you a really dynamic way to paint fur, 
Also, it would work for water, trees, anything where you need some dynamic texture. This is a great technique to have in your toolbox. First, I used a splat type spray bottle that I recently discovered designed by crafter extraordinaire Jim Holtz, which he sells a lot of his wares on Amazon. I used the splat setting to get parts of the cat's body wet, interspersed with about equal amounts of dry bits. Then I allowed my calligraphy brush loaded with milk consistency paint to dance over the surface and it created a beautiful texture that was perfect for a fur underpainting and also would be perfect for a tree canopy or other natural features like water sparkles. Lots of possibilities here, folks. You can then drop thicker paint or different colors into this base while it's wet and create all kinds of amazing effects and textures with a lot of dynamic character in your brushwork. Okay, this technique I've used for years and I've started calling it babysitting. And I do it in almost every painting. And I think it's really particular to watercolor because how watercolor works in particular because with watercolor you start painting and your painting is glistening, it's really wet. And then as it dries, it goes into the buckling stage where it's half dry. And there's a whole nother level of techniques that you can get in this stage that you can't get when your paper is glistening and you can't get when your paper is dry. So if you don't babysit your paper and wait for the exact right time to do these other techniques, then you kind of miss out on some opportunities to get some really interesting textures that no other medium can make. And it's really fun, but you have to babysit. You can't paint and then go get some coffee and ignore your painting. You've got to watch your painting closely to see what stage it's in if you want to use some of these techniques like I'm gonna show you in this next example. And so I was painting my painting Diana, which by the way, I'm doing this in front of the world. I'm painting a painting that I'm hoping eventually will be something that I can submit to women in watercolor competition. If you've been painting for a while, you might be interested in entering this competition and I will encourage you because I entered last year for the first time, but I entered a painting I painted in 2004. And they get over a thousand entries from all over the world. It's the best women watercolors that enter the show and my painting made it into the honorable mentions. That's crazy. And I'd only been painting for four years when I created this painting that made it to the honorable mentions last year. So that has kind of spurred me on to do a painting this year specifically for this competition. And I will say that I do think my painting of Diana is going sideways right now. And so we're going to change it from calling it a painting. We're going to call it a study now. <laughs> but I've been doing so many fun experimental techniques in this painting. And I want to show you a few clips of me working on this painting. And one of the uh, stages that I did was uh, the dark area in her tail. And when I first painted it, it looked really boring. So I babysat it and continued to work that area with different techniques, but I had to wait for different levels of paper moisture dryness before I could do the next stage of technique. So let me just show you so you see what I'm talking about. <laughs> So the first stage of painting is often on very wet paper. So I wet my paper with clear, clean water, and then you see me dropping in this green color. I'm painting negatively around the furs of her tail so that her tail furs look really soft and dreamy. And the softer and dreamier you want something to look, the wetter your paper needs to be when you paint that element. And then I drop in some Windsor Green Gold. So this is another thing that you can do when your paper is very wet, is just drop in different colors next to each other and let them blend and merge themselves for a very impressionistic, soft, dreamy look. And you can't do this when your paper is drier because it won't bloom in and mix together as well as it will when your paper is really wet. So these are all things that you do during the glistening stage, the very wet stage. And then you see me just kind of playing with it, but really what I'm doing is biding my time, waiting for my paper to dry to the next level. I try to lift out some things you can see here, but my paper is way too wet and everything just fills right back in. So I give it a little spray to see if it'll give a little cauliflower effect. And indeed I did get a little bit of cauliflowers, but they weren't that obvious, it was just all too wet. I need to wait until my paper goes into the cauliflowering stage for the next bit of techniques that I wanna use. 
So now as the paper is getting drier, I can use lifting techniques, which you see me doing with a bit of paper towel. My paper is still really wet here. So I'm using an aggressive lifting technique with wadded up paper towel and really pushing it onto my paper. And that is allowing me to get lighter areas to make it look like the light shining through foliage. But again, if I did this on really wet paper, the paint would just fill back in. So you have to babysit and wait for it to get a little bit drier, but not completely dry so that you can use this lifting technique. Then as it goes into the cauliflowering stage and you see me waiting and waiting and waiting, I'm trying to be patient, not good. Here what you see where I look like I'm not doing much is I've got a half drop of water on my brush and I'm dropping it into the white parts of the tail so that the water will, the clear clean water will drop onto that light air of the tail and push into the darker paint. That's why I call this my push technique. It's a cauliflowering technique. And it only works when you're working on half dry buckling paper. So anyway, let's take a look and see what my baby sat area looks like. It looks a lot more interesting than it would have if I would have just left it that all that flat forest green dark color. Also be sure to check out my video that I made about the thumbprint test that helps you measure the moisture levels in your paper to get just the right effects you want. All right, for this next technique, I don't know why I haven't thought to use it up until this moment, up until this painting that I recently did for one of my longtime supporting online students. And I just wanted to give her a thank you gift. So I painted one of her relatives, this girl. And so when you paint portraits, you really have to get them just right. And there's other things sometimes you have to get your drawing skills perfect. You have to get the drawing perfect. Often in portraits or when you're doing a commission of a cat or a dog or anything that is personalized, sometimes you really have to get something very, very accurately drawn. And when you're painting, you're using drawing skills. So this next technique is using a drawing skill that I learned years ago from the classic book by Betty Edwards, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. If you have not read this book, get you to a library right away. And most likely your library does have it because it's just a classic book. But the idea is that when you draw on the left side of your brain, your left side of your brain has really strong ideas of how things will look. And maybe you've noticed this before when you're looking at a painting done by a beginner, their eyes always look like footballs. And that's because they were using their drawing skills using the left side of their brain. The left side of the brain is the artistic side and the left side has these strong ideas about what things should look like. Eyes look like footballs. So whenever a beginner will paint an eye, it'll always end up looking like a football. And then if you use your right side of your brain, where it's the more analytical side, you see the shapes, you see how things are actually shaped and they're very rarely for eyes not shaped like footballs. How do you get your brain to click over from the left side of thinking to the right side of thinking, the more analytical side? Oh, there goes the fire truck. <laughs> Thank you to our heroes, the firemen. And you turn your painting upside down. Let's take a look at me uh, using this technique to get this painting for Donna's niece more accurate. In my particular painting of this girl, I knew her mouth didn't quite look right. It didn't look like her smile. I wasn't sure why. It helped me a lot to turn her upside down to help my brain stop seeing a mouth and just see the shapes that made up the mouth. This helps your eyes see value shapes. The left side of the brain sees a dark line going across to separate the top and bottom lip. If you look on the left side of the girl's mouth, there is a dark sideways V of value that starts at the corner of her mouth and goes further along the top edge of her top lip. I had the dark value just in the corner of her mouth. I needed to extend that dark over to the edge of the first tooth you can see and then add more color to the bottom of her lip. So I did that and now she looks like she's smiling just like in the reference picture. This is also a great way to get eyes right. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoy it because that really helps me get my video in front of more people and that helps me grow this channel and bring you more free content. All right, I'm gonna include this next technique because 
It was one of the most viewed shorts that I recently published. By the way, if you haven't watched my shorts, they're really full of really great information and I don't waste your time. Sometimes I'll do a funny little short, but most of my shorts have really good little succinct tips that really will help you with your watercolor journey. I noticed with my latest shorts, this one was really popular and it's all about tape techniques and there's two basic ways that you can use tape there's probably actually more if you think creatively but the two ways that i'm going to show you today is both using tape as a mask and then lifting out paint and also as a way to corral paint so you get perfectly straight uh, and geometric shapes in your painting. Let's take a look and I'll show you what I mean. So let's first look at a way to add paint. If you're painting a very straight element in your painting, such as a building or a fence, or here in my case, cabinetry and furniture in the background, you can use tape to make sure your lines stay straight. If you plan to use any tape techniques, just be warned, tape will tear cheaper papers that aren't 100% cotton. Tape will also tear hot press paper, I've found. The best paper to use when using tape techniques is on cold press watercolor paper that's 100% cotton. So in this painting, which is also available as a full tutorial, of course, I taped off a few elements that I wanted to make sure I got straight. And here is a bonus tip. I used a clear plastic ruler to line up along the top edge of the painting and make sure that my vertical line was perfectly square. So I taped off the part that I didn't want paint on and that allowed me to paint the element more freely without worrying of going outside my lines or making a wonky line. For thin elements, it is also easier to paint along a continuum of values or different colors when you've taped off the element like I did along the edge of the kitchen counter here. I've used tape in a few ways since finding John Lovett's article about tape techniques in International Artist Magazine. In the watercolor section, John Lovett was talking about using tape. And I was also noticing Thomas Schallers, and he's also very active on Facebook. I was noticing he used these really interesting lightened strips of elements in his composition, like strips of light. I asked him how he did it. He said, lifting. I dug through some of my old paintings. If there were any paintings that I thought would lend themselves well to demonstrating this, what you're going to need is tape and magic eraser. So the original is the one that doesn't have anything added to it. So you can scrub and lighten with this. So the main idea is put tape down around the area you want to lighten, scrub it with a magic eraser blot, and it'll lighten that area that you taped off. Keys for success for painting with tape, like we're gonna do now, is first of all, tape will tear cheap paper. You can't use the Hippie Crafter paper with this technique. You've gotta use good paper. I suggest 100% cotton cold press paper, hot press also tears, even if it's really good quality. So you have to use 100% cotton cold press paper, in my experience. The cheapest cold press that I know of is Baohung, which is sold on Amazon. You have to use non-staining paints, which I'm gonna use cerulean, cobalt, ultramarine, and maybe a little yellow added in to make the sky look more natural. So those are all very non-staining paints. So non-staining paints will lift, because we're gonna lift in this little tutorial. I'd also love to see your paintings. And so you can share those on my free Facebook group where I have a great online community and we all support each other. So I will put that link here. Come join my Facebook group and join the fun. Remember to give this video a like, subscribe if you like my content, and I'll see you next time. Now go watercolor your world. Bye everybody. And let's see how I incorporate. <laughs> yeah, okay. Let